Hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual non-deal roadshow. My name is Celia Muhub, Media Relations Coordinator and Virtual Event Moderator here at Landmark. On behalf of our team, we want to thank everyone for joining us today for the presentation of Generation Mining, trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange under ticker symbol GENM and on the OTCQB under ticker symbol GENMF. Presenting today is Kerry Noll, Executive Chairman and Co-Founder. Without further ado, let's begin the presentation. Thanks, Celia, and welcome. Generation Mining is developing a large palladium copper project in, in Canada. It's known as the Marathon Project. And currently a measured and indicated resource. It's got a little over 4 million ounces of palladium, just over a billion pounds of copper, and a little over a million pounds or uh, ounces of uh, platinum. And it's also got a really nice little gold credit, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So as you know, I'm sure that uh, all of these metals are really key to the greening of the economy. Certainly palladium is not a metal of the future, it's a metal of now. It's been in deficit for over 10 years. <laughs> you read a lot about how it, it's going to fade away into obscurity, but that's going to be a long ways out, and I, I'll get into that a little bit later too. Copper, of course, is a big part of the whole new grid and the electric car and just a lot of different things. It's the best conductor of electricity for the for the cost and so it, it's crucial to to the whole world what's happening in in the electricity and electric cars etc and of course platinum is going to be a big part of any initiative on uh, hydrogen i think that's a little bit of a ways out but it will at some point start to happen i won't get into all of the people because it's we have a lot of people working for us now but Jamie at Levy and myself have been partners for about eight years. We had a, a company previous to this one called Pine Point Mining. And as we were just starting the feasibility study on that in 2018, we uh, got taken over by a company called Osisco Metals and spun this company out of that company. But what I do is build mines, so I went to look for the next best thing, and that turned out to be palladium, and then we looked for a palladium project. Previous to that, some of you in Europe might remember some of the companies that uh, I was uh, involved in starting. Certainly Wheaton River, which my old business partner and I ran for 10 years and built a very successful gold mine in Canada. Uh, uh, Thompson Creek, which started its life as Blue Pearl, and that famously went from 10 cents to $24 and got listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And then, of course, Glencairn Gold, which, which had three operating mines in Central America. And those three mines were taken over by a, a company called B2 Gold in 2008 or 9. And uh, B2, that was their first production. And now, of course, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar company. And B2 has eventually sold those off to a company called Calibre. Those were our assets. And Drew Anwell joined us about two years ago. He's a mining engineer. He was one of the architects and, and builders of Detour Gold, which is now the largest gold mine in Canada. And previous to that, he was a few years at Barrick. He ran the Porgera mine in Papua New Guinea for them. And previous to that, he spent his whole career at Placer Dome until he got taken over by Barrick. And just a little note of interest in the bottom right-hand corner there, John Paul Deco has joined us from Glencore. John Paul was the guy we were dealing with on marketing our concentrates. And as they say, he liked the story so much, he joined us. Board of Directors, again, a lot of really, really top people, top right there, Cashel Meager. He just became president of Capstone Mining. He was also a, a COO at Hud Bay before that, and he built the Constancia Mine for them in South America. Paul Murphy, down below him, is a is a chartered accountant who was his chairman of Alamos Gold, and he used to run the whole mining group for the Western Hemisphere for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And Phil Walford, you may know him if you're a gold bug. He was the founder of Marathon Gold, and he discovered the Valentine Project for them before he retired. And Jen Wagner is the uh, VP Corporate Affairs for Kirkland Lake Gold, which is in the middle of a merger with, with Agnico. And Steve Reapert is a world-class geophysicist. So where are we? We're just uh, northwestern Ontario. Ontario currently has a conservative government and very, very pro-mining, pro-north government. There's a lot going on around us. There's a couple of mines being built. There's a lot of mines operating. There's a few others in the planning stages. And uh, you've got very strong community and First Nation support in most of this area because mining is, 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 has evolved into the, one of the largest parts of the economy in the north. A little tighter in on the property, this blue area is our property. It's about 220 square kilometers. 
The marathon deposit over there on the right is the one that we're, we're going to build into production. But look at the infrastructure we've got, and this is saving us hundreds of millions of dollars compared to some other mines. We've got an airport right there, a commercial airport. We've got the Trans-Canada Highway comes right through the property. We've got a railroad coming just south of us. And of course, the, the town of Marathon. And the town of Marathon is a mining town. It supports the big Hemlo gold mine currently. And probably one of the best strokes of luck we had was this power line, which is under construction by the Ontario government. It's costing a billion dollars. And that power line is bringing high voltage power to the north, and it comes right through our property. The other mines under construction in the, in the region all have to install generators and bring in natural gas in order to generate their own power, which is not very green, of course. We are Ontario Grid, which is, is essentially carbon free. So we're going to have a really great carbon footprint and get cheap electricity. All we have to do is do a two kilometer power line off this spur and put in a substation and we're, and we're ready to go. We did a feasibility study last March, so it's pretty current. Inter interestingly, we did it when steel prices had already moved, so a lot of the inflation that some of the other companies are facing was already built into our, our study. We showed a 13-year mine life, producing an average of 245,000 ounces of palladium equivalent a year, and, and, and we can do that for an upfront capex of 665 million Canadian dollars, or about 520 million US. And we can produce palladium equivalent for an all-in sustaining cost of just over 800 bucks. And what that gives us is uh, in our base case, and for our base case, we, we used a palladium price of 17.25, and it's been above that for most of the last three years. It took one little dip below, but now it's about $2,300 an ounce. And we used also 320 copper, which is well over a dollar below where it is today. And that gave us an IRR of 30%, which is in the top quartile of feasibility studies in the mining industry. And it gave us a net present value in Canadian dollars of, of just over a billion dollars. What's interesting is that at today's prices, and, and, and this was pretty much the spot price when our feasibility study came out, around $2,400 palladium and $4 copper, that net present value doubles. And, and the IRR goes up to 47%, which is probably in the top 5% of, of mining feasibility studies. So a pretty special project. Our payback in the base case is 2.3 years, and our, our payback at spot is a year and a half. Bank, banks, of course, love that. I'm just going to focus on this slide on the top right-hand corner, the distribution of revenue. As you can see, it's at the base case numbers, it's mainly a palladium mine, 58% of the revenue, and then 6 or 27% from the copper. But look at the gold down there, 3.8% of the, of the revenue comes from gold. It doesn't sound like it's th that important, but look what that, I'm going to just show you on the next slide what, what that got us. We did a deal that we announced just before the holidays, the Wheat and Precious. So Wheaton, of course, what goes around comes around. I was the founder of Wheaton River Minerals, and it spun out uh, Wheaton Precious in 2002 after I had left. But Wheaton is going to pay us $240 million to stream that gold and, and about a fifth of the, of the platinum. So e even though that gold doesn't look like it's a big con contributor to this project, it's going to be a huge contributor to the CapEx. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's about a third of the CapEx. And they're going to give us $40 million up front. And that $40 million is going to go towards detailed engineering, some down payments on equipment, and to finish up the permitting process. And the net stream cost to us is 4.8% of, of the mine revenue. And what it does is it actually reduces the payback in the base case from 2.3 years to one and, one and three quarter years. And it increases the IRR to 38%. And the net present value stays about the same. So pretty good. We're... Our next step is to arrange the debt financing. We've been hired Endeavor Financial out of London to arrange that for us. I've been working with David Rhodes there for, for almost three decades on various debt packages. So I, I know that they're able to do this. And we're negotiating currently with banks and other lenders. Smelters are, want to get in, in, interested. And a couple of private equity firms have shown some pretty strong interest as well. And then we may have to add an equity component at the end, depending on how that all plays out. That debt is expected to take us into the summer. It doesn't happen overnight. The Wheaton deal took five months, and I expect the debt to be similar to that. So look at this cash flow. The first three years, Canadian dollars are over a billion dollars in after-tax cash flow, and that's in the base case. It's way higher at today's metal prices, so a pretty special project, and that's, of course, why we get the quick payback. 
And the way we've designed this mine is to get most of the palladium out in the first half of the mine life. At least almost 70% of it comes out in the first half of the mine life. And the reason for that partly is because that's where the cash is right now. That's where the profit is. But also we think that in time, palladium will start to fade. Not, not right away. It'll take some years. But as you may have heard, platinum is getting substituted in catalytic conversion a little bit for palladium. That's not as much as, as people think. It's, it's, it's a small percentage. But the other thing that's happening is, of course, electric cars. And as electric cars roll out, our palladium won't be as necessary. However, there are lots of reasons why palladium will be strong for the next 10 years. And one of those is hybrids. Hybrids use more palladium than a uh, regular car. And the other reason is, is that, of course, when you have uh, emissions testing, like a lot of countries do, you have to replace those converters after eight or 10 or 12 years. And cars that are being sold now will be replacing their converters in, in 10 years. And that's going to still eat up a lot of palladium. Copper, of course, is going to be a big part of the economy going forward. There's not enough copper in the works right now for, for the plans of governments. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. It's the same, same goes for nickel and lithium and a few other elements. But We've designed this to kind of spread the copper over the life of the mine. So once if palladium starts to fade, that'll be due to electric cars. And if electric cars are taking off, then copper is going to take off. So it's a, it's kind of a natural hedge built into the mine. And then, of course, we've got some platinum, a lot of platinum for the first five years. And then, of course, some gold and silver. So sensitivity is really important. What happens if? So if you go down to the bottom of this slide in the CapEx, a lot of people are worried about inflation and mining. Well, if we are 20% over budget, we have still, in the base case, got 24% internal rate of return. And if you look in the bottom right corner there. Going into the very top line, if you look at today's palladium price, um, it adds palladium to around 2300 an ounce. So that's going to add five or $600 million to the net present value from the base case. If you look at today's copper price at 440, that's going to add about 300 million dollars again uh, on top of the palladium to the net present value. These are big numbers for for not not prices that are unrealistic. These are prices that we have today. What's also interesting on the copper side is that today's copper price, copper pays all of the operating costs of this mine, all. So all of that palladium comes out for free, and that's a lot of palladium. And, and lastly, if you go across the top all the way down, if you knocked $1,000 an ounce off the current palladium price, we've still got a 20% IRR. There's mines being built out there that have 18, 16% IRRs. I, I, I think you should have at least 20% as a cushion for, for any problems you might have. But we've got that, even knocking $1,000 off the, the palladium price, and that's also putting copper at 320. So both prices down. We've still got still got a viable mine. That's pretty pretty unusual and pretty special. After the mine itself, the most important thing a company like ours can have is people. And we've been gathering the team to build this mine. And I'll just point out a few of the people on the top right there. Steve Haggerty, he was a VP at Barrick for many years. He built their mills. He fixed their mills. He fixed their metallurgy. And he did our entire flow sheet for our feasibility study. And he's working with wood engineering to do the... Uh, the detailed engineering on our plant. And then I mentioned Drew before on the left there and below him, Paul Murphy. That's a different Paul Murphy than is on our board of directors. And Paul is, is he was with G Mining and he was the, the lead guy on our feasibility study for G Mining. And again, he liked this project so much, he actually left G Mining and joined us to build the mine, which is, he said, is one of the best projects he's ever seen. He was also before that VP projects at Santerra, and then he was GM of uh, engineering and construction for IM Gold, where he built four or five mines for them. So he's been through this before. And on the ESG side, we brought over Catherine Moffat from Detour Gold, she, where she worked with Drew, and she is, is doing our community relations. And then we just hired Jeremy Dart last fall from Hemlo, from Barrick, uh, and he lived in Marathon for the last 20 years, and he was the guy that did all of their environmental and community and indigenous, indigenous relations. So he knows all the people, all the players up there. I'm going to talk just a little bit about palladium for those of you who don't follow it. I'll be brief on it. So palladium is used, most of it is used in cars to scrub out the, the carbon monoxide and the nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is 300 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And you don't hear much about it because it's already being scrubbed out and it's 
it's turning it it's converted to, to nitrogen which is uh, you know more than 70 percent of our atmosphere so the loads in vehicles have been increasing in places like china now india brazil is talking about it indonesia is talking about it and that's because they're if you travel to some of those countries the capital cities are extremely polluted and so they, they need to clean the air and they're this is this is one of the ways that they do it uh, annual demand worldwide is about 11 million ounces as i mentioned it was it been in deficit for for the last decade and it's going to be in deficit for the foreseeable future which is why we're getting the high prices we did have a we did have a bit of a dip in the price last fall it went from all the way from 2800 down to 1600 and in, 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 and that was largely due to the chip shortage it was you know you take you take 10 or 15 percent of the car manufacturing away and suddenly there's it goes into surplus and that's what happened but then as the chip shortage ended it's not ended yet but as it's ending the speculators are, have gotten involved and i think it's probably moved up a little bit too fast but it's gone it's gone up uh, 700 dollars an ounce in the last seven weeks which is quite an impressive uh, move you don't ever see gold doing something like that and again we think it's going to stay in deficit for the for the foreseeable future now moving on to the carbon intensity this is in canada of the 14 copper mines in canada if we were in production we would be the second lowest on a copper equivalent basis we didn't do a palladium equivalent basis because there's only one other palladium mine in, in canada and we don't know what the, the carbon footprint of that is this was done by scar and associates out of london england who who does it for mining companies all around the world so they have a big database anyways we will have one of the cleanest and greenest of the, of the copper mines in in canada and if you look on the world basis it gets even better we're in the bottom four percent of carbon emissions worldwide in terms of copper equivalent so that's a pretty special place to be one of the key jobs we have this year is is the permitting and i won't you know this is i know this is a very busy slide so i won't get too much into it but if you go to the right hand column there we have gotten in in the short time we've had this project in two and a half years we've restarted the permitting process we have gotten all through all of the different steps all the way to project sufficiency and that means what that means is is the project sufficiency has has been acknowledged by the government they have the information that they need to make a decision the next step is to have hearings to the public and that's 30 days of just presentation after presentation on everything from from the greenhouse gases to wildlife to water discharge to all of the different aspects of the mine we have to present to the public and once that's done after 30 days the joint review panel which is, has been appointed by the government was appointed by the government in 2020 has 90 days to make their recommendation and then the, the government after that has four months to decide whether they accept those recommendations or not but they usually do so the we, we should know in the in the june or july what exactly the joint review panel plans to do and then after that, uh, the government can issue us the permits. We've, we're applying for the permits now so that they're ready to go when the EA is, is approved. So we're expecting all of this to happen this year and hopefully with a little bit of luck starting construction at the end of this year, which is a good time to do it because in the winter here uh, is a good time to be cutting trees. It's a lot better than, than, than having to do it in the summer when there's you know swamps and the things like that to cross. So some of the other things in our timeline then, of course, I mentioned before the mine financing, we expect that to, to, to happen in the, you know, towards the summer. First Nations agreements, we announced last week that we had signed a, a very important agreement with the, the largest and the closest First Nation to us. And there's another First Nation we're dealing with as well. And we're hoping to have a deal signed with them shortly. We're also doing the detailed engineering. We brought on wood in, in uh, October to start that process. And they've been going full bore i know by the bills we're getting that they're they're working hard on it and we're hoping to start construction at the end of this year and if it's not the end of this year then it'll be early next year and it's about a 18 to 20 month process so that's it and and, and of course once this mine is built it's going to be worth a lot of money we're still exploring this is a, an example of a rock that was found a few years ago it's one of the richest pgm samples ever found 188 grams per ton and a nine percent copper we don't know where this came from but we know that it's it is local it is somewhere on the property somewhere probably deep down in the system 
and was probably brought to surface or near surface by a volcanic eruption at some point in, in time. And I won't get into the detail, but we have a lot of, lot of showings. This is the property. There's the town of Marathon in the bottom center there. So we have all of these different showings and most of them have not been drilled. And so we expect that over time, there's going to be a lot more found. We have about 30 or 40 kilometers of strike length on, on this property. That's a, it's an incredible size property. So if this mine was in Canada and it was in production today, it would be the seventh largest mine in Canada. So in some pretty good company. And if you did a gold equivalent on it, it would be almost 300,000 ounces a year. And this just shows, this is the Canadian, mostly Canadian and, and a couple of other PGM mines. But this just shows the IRR when these companies did their feasibility study and then made the decision to go ahead into production at some point. And as you can see, we, we compare favorably, and this is in the, this is in the base case consensus numbers. If you look at the spot prices, we're head and shoulders above any of them. And if you did the net present value over CapEx, again, most of these are, some of these are less than one. So their, their net present value is actually lower than the CapEx. We're at 1.63 in the base case. And at, at today's metal prices, three times, which is a very, very, again, very special. You don't, you just don't see it very often in mining. And you may have heard of the Lasson curve. I, I interviewed Pierre Lassonde when I was a journalist way back in the 80s when he wrote the book that contained this chart, and this chart is still around. So we're in a very good spot. This is where the institutional strategic smart money starts getting into a project once it starts construction. So we're going to be there towards the, the, the end of this year, and we think we're just in a really, really good spot here. Our price to net present value, again, this is base case numbers. This is not our graph. This is prepared by one of the brokerage firms, one of the ones that has a has a research report out on us. The research reports have an average of about $2 and I think 15 cents a share. So uh, almost uh, two and a half times where we are today. And it shows we're trading at only 15% of our net present value. And if you did spot prices, we'd be trading at 8% of our net present value. So there's a lot of room to move here. Part of the issue is probably palladium. They don't, palladium doesn't have as big a following as gold. And a lot of people don't even know what it's used for. So we're trying to educate the public on that. But I think, I think at some point we're going to move at least to the middle of this chart. And that would, uh, that would mean, a, a, you know, about three times where we are today. So to sum up, we've got 173 million shares outstanding. We have some pretty smart shareholders. Sabanye Stillwater out of South Africa, which is the largest platinum company and the second largest palladium company in the world, owns 19% of us. When we bought them out of their share of this project with shares, they told us they wanted shares. They didn't want, they didn't want cash. We offered them either one. Lucas Lundin, Eric Sprott, a couple of mining billionaires, uh, again, they, they bought in, in our financings and have seemed to have held the stock all the way through. Cisco Mining, again, has been involved in our financings. And the directors and officers have been buying shares out of the market and on each financing all the way through. So we've been uh, we've been also very active in this talk. So that covers it. That's the uh, that's the presentation. I think we're ready now for the question period. Thank you so much for the presentation, Kerry. We will now move on to the question and answer portion. Your first question here is: At what price did mining for palladium become economic? Probably around a thousand dollars an ounce. In in our case, it depends, of course, on the grade. Most palladium historically has been produced in South Africa as a byproduct of platinum. Platinum for most of history was a lot higher price than palladium. And in fact, as recently as five years ago, platinum was around $1,500 and palladium was only around $800. And then the other big producer is Russia at the Norilsk mine, and that was a, palladium was always a byproduct of nickel. So you've got this supply that was was inelastic as far as the price of the metal went and it was being produced and, and a lot of it was actually being stockpiled because there wasn't even a use for it over the years and then finally uh, catalytic converters came along and, they, and it went into deficit so around a thousand dollars an ounce is what would make our uh, our mine uh, economic or not and it's of course trading around twenty three hundred dollars an ounce right now are you able to leverage modern technology to further reduce the 2.3 years base case payback the technology isn't going to reduce it. The technology, what the technology is going to do is things like increase recoveries uh, over time. 
we've already chosen the technology to, to build the mine, but there is always other things that we're looking at. So things that might be introduced partway into the mine life. That, that's one thing that we could do. The other thing we could do to reduce the payback, of course, is try to find a way to lock in some of these higher prices. If we can lock in, when we start construction, for example, if we can lock in a palladium price for the first two years of mining at say 22 or $2,300 an ounce, that would reduce the payback drastically. How many royalty companies competed for the streaming deal that was awarded to Weaven Precious Metals? Were all the big players interested? So all of the big players at one point or another gave us term sheets. Some of those were withdrawn as palladium prices were going down and some, but I think there was about 12 streaming and royalty companies altogether that uh, were in the negotiating, but, but the Wheaton deal was by far the, uh, the best offer we had. Have you seen any cost inflation increases since announcing the feasibility study? So we have not. Now, that said, we haven't done the detailed engineering and we have not put any of these things out to tender yet. So that's going to be happening through this spring and, and into, the, into the summer and, and actually into the, towards the end of the year, that'll all start to happen. So we'll, have, we'll know then the exact prices. As I mentioned before, the steel, for example, we had already caught the high steel prices when we did the feasibility study. Our, our biggest I guess fear would be that there could be labor inflation, but that said, we've got three mines, three gold mines, uh, large open pit gold mines under construction in, in our region in Ontario, and they're all way ahead of us in terms of timing. So, so people will be coming off of those projects and looking for additional work. So we think that the labor market will be favorable to us by the time we start construction. We'll start needing those people kind of uh, in the first or second quarter of next year. But yeah, cost inflation is always a worry. We've certainly got huge inflation in terms of our output, the products that we're going to be producing. Every single thing on our list is is higher than our feasibility numbers. But we'll know, we'll know like any mine, you do a feasibility study, it's plus or minus 15% of the time it's printed. And then you go in and you do your detailed engineering. Then you put it out to tender. And that's when you finally know the exact prices. But we're not afraid because we, we told G Mining and Asenko right from the start that, hey, we're going to build this mine. We want to know what it's going to cost. We're not dressing this up to try to sell it like a lot of junior companies. We're going to build this mine, so please tell us what it's going to cost. And I think we do have a good number. Does your current feasibility study take into account the cost increases the sector has been experiencing recently? Yes, I think it does. But until we know until we actually get bids on the work, you don't know the exact price. And, and uh, I, like I say, we use G Mining. G Mining has built some of the big mines and they've done them on budget. They did the Prucha del Nor mine for Lundin Gold. They did the big Malartic mine. They did the expansion of Detour Lake. So they, they, they've done this before and, and, they, and they tend to come in on budget. So we're, we're comfortable. How significant will be the shipping and smelting charges be? Well, that depends on where we ship it to. So we're negotiating with the different uh, smelters right now. And of course, shipping costs can, can be high or they can be low. Probably too expensive to ship to, to, to Asia. So we're kind of focusing on, uh, there's a smelter in Quebec that's the closest, but you know, it'll depend on what kind of a deal they give us. And then there's uh, some smelters in Europe um, that, that we're also negotiating with. And there's one trading house as well that we're negotiating with. So we're looking at them all. That's what we brought on JP Deco for. He was a former Glencore guy. And, uh, you know, the closer is better if we can get the right deal. So uh, hoping to ship it to Quebec, but uh, we'll see what happens. What will it take for the generation mining stock to be re-rated? It, it will get re-rated over time. I mean, we did start three years ago at a 10 cents and we raised our first uh, money to buy this project at 28 cents and our next financing was at 52 and then after that i think we did a small financing at 72 so they've been it's been higher and higher and higher so it, it, the stock has performed very well but to get re-rated i think people want to see what the cost of the mine is going to be they want to see that we've got the financing in place and they want to see our permits delivered so that's all part of this year and as as, as announcements are made as time goes on, I think that 
uh, will get re-rated. And we're also looking forward to getting some research reports. We're hoping to get some from some of the big banks here in Canada. They, they Right now, the firms that have given us research reports are much smaller. So, and we are talking to some of those big banks. We were just at the TD uh, mining conference last week here in Toronto. And we were also at the, um, we're going to the BMO uh, conference in Florida at the, at the end of February. Has a dividend policy ever been discussed? And if so, at what stage or milestones would you need to hit for it to be implemented? Well, that's a ways out as far as uh, dividend goes. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of dividends, don't get me wrong, but we have to we have to finance the mine we have to build the mine and we have to pay back the banks before we can even think about a dividend so at that point that that's where the board will start to discuss it and as i said i'm in favor of it so i i at my age i currently live on dividends so it's a it's a big part of my life and it would be lovely to be able to pay a dividend out of this company someday generation mining has put out some positive news lately but the stock continues to see pressure to what do you attribute the recent the recent downward pressure? So a few things. One is is we have some warrants that are uh, coming due, as you can see there. They're coming due on February 13th, and I think there's been a little bit of uh, selling pressure on the on the shares due to that. We also have, you know, overall just the gold sector has been uh, hasn't hasn't really done that well, and a lot of People lump us in with gold, you know, as a, as a you know, palladium is a precious metal. And I think that people are also skeptical that we're going to uh, be able to finance this. And I think that we did get a bit of a re-rating from the 60s to the, to, you know, towards 90 cents uh, when we announced the Wheaton deal. And I think as we announce other milestones, that will continue to uh, to improve. Is BN the only group in the project area that requires an agreement? No, BN is the largest and the closest uh, of the of the First Nations. They're in that respect very important to us. But there's another First Nation about 100 kilometers away called Hayes Platte, and we are negotiating with them. We're hoping to get something in the next couple of months with them. So those are the two that we actually have to sign agreements with. The other groups so far have just wanted to know all about the environmental impact. And you know we've had to work with their their uh, consultants to show show the environmental impact, and and we've been doing that. Can the current MOA be changed by either party, and what would typically cause that to happen? Well, I suppose anything can be changed. We we negotiated very hard on that for a year, so I would be surprised if there's any changes. But yeah, so but I mean, I guess they anybody can change their mind, but I don't think these these folks will they're very very professional and they've been very honorable in everything that we've done with them so I, i'm you know i'm pretty sure that you know where we are right now is where we're going to be when we sign the final agreements and those those were hoping to happen you know in the next month or two but don't hold me to that timeline when will generation mining be putting out guidance for 2022 I think we put out what guidance we are going to put out. We've said that we're going to be hoping to finish the permitting, hoping to get the bank financing, and hoping to begin construction and do the, finish the detailed engineering. So that's our goal this year, and that's our guidance. And we're not producing anything yet. We won't be producing in our first initial production won't be until 2024, and full production won't be until 2025. Are there any permits that are yet to be obtained that could potentially cause, cause delays at this point? We have to obtain all, all the permits. We can't even, the governments can't even grant the permits until our environmental uh, impact uh, assessment is has been approved by the government. That's step one, and that's not a permit, that's, a, that's an assessment of the project. Simultaneous to that, we are apl applying, we're preparing the applications and applying for the permits and negotiating them with the government. And once the EA is approved, we can then move to have the permits approved. But the, we do not have permits yet. I mean, we have permits, we have a lot of permits. We have permits for exploration, we have permits for road access, etc. But we don't have any mining permits yet and we wouldn't expect to have them yet. Uh, but that's what we're working on, and that's what we've been working on, and it's uh, it, it, we're to the tune of $10 million uh, this year alone. Uh, that, that's the kind of money that's going into these permits. So it's going to happen, but we do not have them yet. 
How was the project NPV affected by the wheat and precious metals deal? The net present value did not change materially. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's it's essentially the same. So at the base case, around a billion dollars Canadian, and, and at uh, today's prices, it's around $2 billion Canadian. What changed was the internal rate of return because we don't have to put as much money into building it. And uh, what also changed was the payback uh, was reduced drastically. Thank you so much, Kerry. That concludes our presentation for today. But before you go, I will turn it back to you, Kerry, for final remarks. Thanks, Celia. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And thanks for, wow, a lot of good, good solid questions. Uh, um, really good questions. And that's always, uh, I always like to, to have that. So uh, please uh, go to our website if you want to continue to follow us and, and sign up for, for uh, I know Renmark will be sending you all the, all the material, but um, certainly we do from time to time town hall meetings, et cetera, with our management on various subjects such as exploration. And um, uh, so uh, if you want to get invited to those, please sign up at our website. And uh, again, uh, thanks for coming out. Thank you for your time today, Kerry. Once again, this was Generation Mining trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange under ticker symbol GENM and on the OTCQV under ticker symbol GENMF. Thank you to everyone in Europe and surrounding areas for joining us today. Stay tuned for other presentations and see you soon.